it's tube, but you can say that uh, it's not like a tube. So of course, like you can make a tube like this, that will be like tedious job. So you can have actually think the tube, you can suppress the tube, and uh, consider in terms of a ribbon, and uh, follow these lines of like magnetic field lines. Like okay. And then this uh, flux will be like to any cross-sectional area like this. This is how you can actually imagine this as a flux tube. And, uh, this point is like connected to this point, so it's a periodic uh, box kind. So it's infinite uh, flux tube, let's say. Then that now it's something about the orientability and non-orientable surface. So let's say if I just take the uh, sheet like this and I join like this. So this is how we construct orientable surface. Meaning if, we, meaning if I follow one surface, I will always remain on the surface. One surface. So I won't be covering the other surface. Meaning if you just stick one coordinate system, let's say the XYZ coordinate system here, or just the XY plane here. If you follow the surface by joining just simply, what you see that the handedness of the system doesn't change. So that is actually the definition of a uh, uh, non-orientable surface. Oh, sorry, orientable surface. Similarly, true for the inner surface. If you just follow the track on the inner surface, you always preserve the orientability. Meaning the handedness doesn't change. <laughs> so if you just do some operations here and there, if I just cut it from the between, you get two separate uh, rings. Let's say I join this here and I cut it from here, you get two separate rings. Nothing uh, so surprising. But let's say instead of joining like this, I just joined it like this. Okay. You can always do this. So this is just your flux tube. And instead of joining this way, you join this way. One more point which we had thought uh, regarding this ABC flow, which is uh, Arnold, Beltrami and Childress flow, which is actually a helical flow, which is a, uh, uh, the flow itself is like very, it has a maximum helicity. So I'll just speak a few words on this ABC flow, but before that like it's good to do this experiment. So if you join things like this, and now if you start following one surface, meaning you just start coloring it, okay, what you see that you have covered both the surfaces. So it's a non-orientable surface. So if you start from one point with a right-handed uh, coordinate system, you go along the surface, then you come back, you see that your handedness of the system has changed. Then you get a left-handed uh, coordinate system. So that is a non-orientable surface. Yeah. And this is called the Mobius strip. So it's the simplest one I can uh, just now make. Uh, you can actually think of in terms of Mobius volume also. Pictorial representation will be uh, something like this. Meaning you have, you join these two the same way, but one has the opposite way. This is how you get the Mobius strip. Now it's your flux tube, non-orientable. And I start cutting it from between, let's say. You can cut it from between. Doing one operation, which is an allowed operation, 
that uh, allowed operation meaning uh, non allowed operation is feed lines will not cross each other by saying that what we mean is that we are in this limit that uh, magnetic knot number is very high so feed lines will not cross each other okay but now we have cut it once and this has oh, got a wait a minute sir magnetic points can never cross each other because magnetic field is unique right it's a unique function of position no, meaning, so they can never cross each other no, what i meant was like there is no reconnection there is no these things they are like neglected yeah. yeah. so now we have uh, another thing now what we do is uh, you cut it again so after cutting it once like it has got some memory if you cut it once more it has a direct connection with the receiver After cutting it once, you got a link. There are two separate uh, rings with a link inside, right? You can't separate them. So it's a link you have produced, right? Can you see that? Yeah. So you can do this experiment, and now both these rings are like orientable. Both these rings are orientable surfaces <coughs> with a link inside. So this is what like uh, you can actually think. Uh, one can think in terms of. Actually, you see that linking number has a direct like uh, helicities can be uh, expressed in terms of a linking number. The helicity is like uh, number of links two times and uh, alpha is a that formula. So one can wonder that although you had no links before, you produced a link. So maybe you have uh, something more uh, more helicity or but it's not uh, actually correct. Well. So, do you have questions? So the concept of an orientable surface is something which has apparently not really that direct analogy with magnetic fields.
abstract way of like representation of such a this thing, which Simon will uh, speak on. That how you can actually draw these things on a board, and then uh, this was like the simplest, like just a two twist. You can make further twist, and you can count the linking number for this. So if you count linking number for this, you find it zero. So linking number is actually still zero. But instead of following twist here, it's better to follow the boards. What is the linking number is zero? It's not zero. It is zero. It's just like a. Yeah, it is zero. Just twice, right? Yeah. No. This is twisty. I think. I'm going to talk about this now. I can easily see that the linking number is zero actually, because as it as uh, you have the reference now, you cannot really see it. So then it's better to do the two twists and cut. Then at least linking number will be preserved. It will be equal to the twist. Because uh, you have yeah, this is like in this also twist has been increased. There are more twists than uh, earlier there was just one twist. Now there are more twists than no, yeah. Yeah. So now you got more twists with the linking number zero. Although it looks like this. Uh, one way to see which linking number uh, this lot actually has, which you're holding in your hands, um, maybe I should show you some very practical diagrams which people use when they're considering uh, links. So um, uh, basically, a uh, very simple example is uh, um, two interlinked links lots. This is basically your Möbius strip. So it's simply you start like this, and then you turn 180 degrees, and come back here, and then you turn again 180 degrees and you go to the beginning. So now you make one cut. So now you have um, these two um, these two uh, strips. And as you can see, they are not independent because you start here, then you go up, have a twist, twist here, go back and have another twist here, and get up here. So you can see that uh, this has two twists by 180 degrees, and um, 
it is only one strip. So when you make a second cut, each line is actually one uh, ribbon. Now you find out each line and you see that the blue one is independent of the red one. This was your second cut. And every cut reduces the flux by half. So you can count the fluxes and the number of this. That will be the third point. <coughs> So, uh, okay. so basically when you watch uh, your ribbons and uh, you have the zero cuts, you have cut one twist by 180 degrees. And uh, now And uh, the width of the ribbon is uh, the full length. So uh, the width is that one. Is it better than four? Then you can have four to one. Length. Yeah. Okay. So let's say. So. Okay. And you make one cut, and you have one ribbon with a twist of 360 degrees. Uh, but it's a width of only two. <coughs> and then the last cut, second one, um, you have a width of only one. And uh, first of 360 degrees. But you've got two of those. So when you do that, some math, you just multiply uh, those 180 degrees and four. And, uh, what did you get? 720. And it's the same everywhere. So, um, and since the twisting is the same as, well, in helicity terms speaking, it's the same as uh, linking, uh, the helicity is all the same in all those um, uh, cases. And uh, so the synchronicity comes only from the twisting and linking on the zero. Hmm. But I hope this was somewhat clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I think that we can write this one in a more easy way. Basically, what you have actually. And when you count here, you get uh, something like plus, plus, and minus, minus, and so you end up zero. So the linking is actually zero. You should probably think of uh, this picture. I think Eric from Axel probably that is a good Eric about writing introducing a piece. Yeah. which is for the alpha effect. It's always a very difficult picture to understand. Mm -hmm. So maybe you should try to represent that in this particular case, because this looks very easy to understand. And, uh, yes. What he means is, uh, I think this one, you take the flat thing, I think we need to cut it <coughs> like this, and we put and then we tilt it, right? That's the idea. Yes. And then we want to calculate the helicity. But of course, that, that net one should be zero. Yes, it's zero, and then it has one party into this. Yes, exactly. And you can you uh, demonstrate the difference between. So you would expect that you have generated right in this operation. And this can only happen at the expense of when you say twist at the, with the same value but opposite side. Actually, yeah, you can see it. Okay. Yes. I have a, I have yes. a demonstration of that. Yes, yeah, the demonstration. Oh. Is that the thing you said about it? No, no, no.
It's a false pipe, which was just colored to see easier the twist. Obviously, it's a uh, what uh, elastic body, right? So what, what I did, I took it this false pipe and then twisted the one of the ends, fixed one end, and twisted the other one either by 180 degrees uh, here or by 90 degrees here. Look at this. This is black, and this is white. It is twisted by exactly 80 degrees. But because helicity is conserved, there is this buckle, which is turned by 180 degrees. If you turn this by 90 degrees, if you look here at the columns, you will see that it's turned. This end has been turned by 90 degrees. And this uh, loop is at 90 degrees angle to the original loop. So, you twist it by 90 degrees, the loop buckles by 90 degrees. The helicity is perfectly conserved. And these are real photographs. It took sort of several days to make sure that <laughs> <laughs> they, they look more or less understandable. So these are real physical objects. The, the photographs were doctored a little bit, just to enhance <laughs> the color. <laughs> but, but only to enhance the color, nothing else. The real photographs. Another thing that I was doing was take a simulation, so a, a real simulation. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and you have a flow which leads to a twist of a tube. And, the, and you can actually do it even analytically using the Cauchy solution. So you just have to make up a flow, which we have in the paper with Yusef and myself. And then you calculate the helicity spectrum. Uh, H of K, which Simon was showing earlier. And of course, the uh, integral over H of K is zero, but you have contributions with negative sign at small case, which compensate positive contributions at large case. So you do have felicity at different scales, with different sign, but the net, of course, has to be zero. That's another thing that I find quite convincing. At least that way you cannot really cheat it yourself so easily. Yeah. <laughs> <That's no. laughs> anyway, so do you have anything more to say? Or, uh, <coughs> yeah, I think just to, to okay. Yeah. Just there is another example like that, even from, which is a DC flow. Uh, if you just take this flow, and we have the XYZ component of our velocity, and if you find out the terms of this velocity, you find it is exactly the same as the velocity. I mean, this being the flow, you take a curve. So the U is actually traveling to curve of U. That means U dot omega is like maximum. So this is like an example for a helical flow. But now if you consider uh, uh, such a flow to be like magnetic field to, to have such a property, let's say the magnetic field B is parallel to curl of U. So as like uh, in the earlier talk by uh, uh, Kandu, and that you see that uh, the Lorentz forces Z dot B, right? And in such of yeah, Lorentz forces U dot J, uh, J cross B. U dot J cross B is the uh, sort of Lorentz force. So you see that in such a case when B becomes parallel to curl of B, this particular term drop, drops out. So this is like a force-free situation, which is actually exactly helical flow. So 
just an example. Uh, but then there is a question like which I don't know the answer. Okay, let me discuss that. It's like regarding the belterization. Uh, meaning, if you start with the not such a configuration, meaning the flow or the magnetic fields with not such a property, let's say, uh, which is not uh, following this, but this eventually is uh, corresponding to the minimum energy configuration. Uh, if we do some analysis, we find that it is a minimum energy configuration. So, if let's say the magnetic field does not follow this, so can the evolution lead to such a configuration, which is the configuration of maximum velocity, with this information? Is what initially initially zero velocity initially? No, no, let's say initially uh, even if there is a finite velocity, but not uh, exactly this, bring not the maximum velocity. In this way, you are actually maximizing the velocity also. So let's say the evolution can be, evolution become such that uh, you ultimately end up having such a configuration. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you start with maximum velocity and single scale, of course, Lorentz force is zero. But if you start with anything which is slightly non-maximum. And let it decay. Then I do I think axial arm simulation by Robbie Banerjee and Francis <coughs> Arans it shows that the field decays roughly the non helical parts mm -hmm. and becomes maximally helical. That's what we all have to see in our simulation. So it becomes helical, but that's because of decay. Faster decay of the non helical. Exactly. Faster decay of But then there was a question which we were discussing with Andrew Berger. Uh, imagine, for example, that you have a small scale dynamo. Will, it, uh, will then it be affected by the ability of the field? You have initial field which, is, uh, which has non zero ability. Or initial field which has zero initial velocity, or even higher order invariance. Okay, but what's the driving? Is it driving helical or non helical? Non helical. Uh -huh. Then it probably doesn't that much. Uh, if it decays differently, will it grow differently? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. So maybe yes or maybe not. I don't think it will grow differently because it will only grow because of small scale dynamo action in that case. Well, the small scale dynamo is sensitive to the decay, right? No, no. Is the, the, any dynamo action is so the balance the between scale. growth and decay. Now, small decay small. is sensitive to the density. Yeah, but we are talking about a, a growth by many orders of magnitude. Yes. And then the initial period simply cannot matter anymore. Yeah, and the density is too small in that case. Yeah. Yes. yes. So the relative velocity will really become smaller and smaller because that one is the fix of course the actual velocity. But because the energy goes up because of dynamite, the relative velocity will decay, uh, will become very, very small. Probably, but worth trying still. Mm -hmm. okay. Well one more point you should be careful about is that even if you have a maximally helical field, a spectrum, maximally helical spectrum. The field evolves. So it's not force free because there's more coupling. So J in one scale couples to B in another scale, and the field evolves, and that's why it decays. So it, there are lots of confusions about these kind of things. That if you have maximally helical, it's force free. Not true. Only if you have a single scale yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, that's what like it's this one key. Any other comments or questions? All right. Um, is it okay if we have a, another seminar by Petri now? I, I don't think we're we still on, right? Not like this one. Huh? Well, I'm uh, 60 minutes power on my phone, so that's the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> I don't take my Okay, so let's prepare for another seminar then. Thanks again for keeping <laughs>
So, I will be talking about convection simulations, numerical convection simulations. And uh, this is a bit more like a uh, talk in a uh, conference, so there might be some material which is not being gone through uh, with everybody, but then I can only encourage some people, some godfathers of these methods to give seminars of their own later on. And uh, what I'm mostly interested in is the large-scale dynamos in convection simulations. And what the large-scale dynamo is, is that we have, uh, like Kandu explained in his talk, that we have magnetic fields uh, whose uh, length scale is uh, significantly larger than the length scale of the typical turbulent eddies. And uh, why convection is interesting is, of course, the uh, fact that uh, we know that the outer layers of the sun are convectively unstable. So uh, the outermost 30% of the solar, the solar radius are convectively unstable, which means that fluid motions are transporting the energy. And uh, we are not first approximation, we're not trying to do the sign, nowhere near actually, as we shall see. So we take just a Cartesian box where we solve uh, the equations of compressible magnetic hydrodynamics. And we have a bunch of parameters here which describe rotation, shear flow, then Reynolds number which is, should be familiar by now. And uh, then we have the Prandtl number, which all of these parameters are essentially then bounded by the limited computational facilities that we have at our disposal. <coughs> and I liked the way Kandu described helical motion. He said that you have to have a screw-like motion. And uh, convection by itself, without any con uh, rotation or shear, it's not yet screwed up, so we have to screw it up with rotation or shear or both. And uh, why we do this is that we want to make the flow helical. And uh, again, in Kandu's talk, he showed that when we have helically forced turbulence, then we can have these large scale magnetic fields. And uh, another aspect here which helps, of course, is shear, which can uh, just uh, stretch stretch field lines uh, and then put energy into them. And this is just an animation of one of our simulations. We have constant heat input from below, then we have a convectively stable layer, and on top of that we have a convection zone. And uh, this all seems very nice. We can do lots of things with this, but uh, unfortunately nothing realistic. This is a table that I compiled for my PhD thesis a few years ago. And here we have some of the same dimensions, parameters, and what we estimate them to be in the sun. And then what we can realistically do <coughs> with our direct simulations. And we see that an overwhelming majority of these parameters are well beyond our reach at the moment. But what we can do actually is we can more or less correctly model the rotational influence on the flow. And uh, for the rest, we just have to do the best we can at the moment. So that's a word of warning. And when we have this setup where we have... Put out this time to uh, crawl the magnetic field. We start with a very weak initial field. And this is from our one of our highest resolution runs, which 
in real time it took something like six weeks to do. And uh, it was kind of agonizing to wait to see what happens if we get a large scale field. Because in the beginning, we do have a fluctuation dynamo here, so all the magnetic fields are just this uh, small scale. Yes? What is the numerical resolution? That's 512 cubes. Okay. And uh, here you see the same simulation, but here we have a horizontally averaged magnetic field. The horizontal components of this of the magnetic field. Set components is uh, vanishing due to the horizontally uh, periodic boundaries. And we see that only after long enough time we do see the clear signal, signal in the average field. And uh, <coughs> we see that uh, this is for much lower Reynolds from the speed results. We see that the growth rate of the magnetic field is proportional to the shear rate at least for slow shear, then for large shear, something happens that uh, decreases the growth rate. And uh, one of the main things in this study was to uh, determine whether we can have simultaneously a small scale dynamo and a large scale dynamo. And we can, of course, well, that's, how, uh, that's our understanding at the moment. So a small scale dynamo doesn't kill off a large scale dynamo. But of course, our Reynolds number here is very low compared to the sun. It's not 10 to 9 what we would have to have in the sun. This is something like uh, 120 in our units in this particular case. And 120 may sound low, but our definition is such that we always get 2 pi less than everybody else. So what's the magnetic diffusion time in those units for that picture? Uh, magnetic diffusion time. Uh, that's, I can't tell an exact number, but it's of the order of 50 to 100 grams. Yeah. So those blue and yellow things are coming in at about 4 or 5 diffusion times. Um, yeah, of that order of magnitude. So the, five, the 400 on the butterfly diagram uh, then probably corresponds to 4 diffusion time given that the Reynolds number is 100. Yeah, that's so the whole run is, if you, is four diffusion times. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things here is that you really need to run these simulations for a very long time to see a large scale field, or any field, in, in fact. Okay, then here are some things that I will not cover. One of them is the test field method with which you can compute turbulent transport coefficients that you can use in your mean field theory. And uh, like we learned in Kandu's talk, one figure is worth a thousand words and then one equation is worth a thousand figures. So <laughs> these two equations speak volumes here. Uh, I wasn't at Karl Heinz's lecture, so maybe even this one here is not defined. So this epsilon here is just uh, the average of uh, small scale velocity across small scale magnetic field, what we call the electromotive force, and the electromotive force goes into the mean field induction equation that we have. Now this bar here is not signifying that this is a vector, but the mean value so it's essentially the same as the normal induction equation except for this E term here, which is the electromotive force. And uh, in order, order to close our equations, we need to somehow express the electromotive force in terms of the large scale magnetic field. And actually, this is a serious expansion that you, you can have in the large scale magnetic field. But usually, we don't deal with uh, terms that are higher than first order in the derivatives. 
And actually, in this case, we cannot because we are using test fields, which only, well, they would actually, in this case, have infinite number of derivatives, but we only consider the first one. And what is the point of all this trouble? The point is that uh, we would like to test whether these mean field, whether these tran turbulent transport coefficients can actually explain the large scale fields that we see, or the dynamo that we see in these equations. And uh, the way to test it is that we take these coefficients, the most important here are the alpha coefficients, these two, and then the diffusion, turbulent diffusion here. So we construct a 1D induction equation, which is essentially this equation here, but in terms of the vector potential. And now we just have the, uh, this is the attraction, it comes from the attraction term. Here we have terms from the electromotive force, and then we also, also have the constant sort of molecular diffusion, which is not, of course not molecular in our simulation, but much higher. And uh, what we find in some cases, in this particular case where we have both rotation and shear, we find that our simulation results fall quite nicely on top of this topmost line here, which is, uh, this is now the growth rate of the magnetic field, where we use the full alpha ij and eta ij tensors. These are four tensor components in this case, showing that we can successfully reproduce our full 3D results with 1D mean field model. This is not always the case, but this is uh, the best case scenario that we have. If we drop rotation in this case, then we also change our co coefficients here, and then we cannot really find a nice fit any longer. But this we can, we can actually explain away, at least qualitatively, if not quantitatively at the moment, because the large scale dynamo can be also excited if this coefficient here is zero, the mean of this coefficient is zero, but if, if it has large enough fluctuations in time and space, then it can also drive a dynamo. And this is something that our method here doesn't capture, and this is what we uh, think that could explain the, uh, the situation in which rotation is effective. Now, all of this was done when we have both rotation, or we always have shear, and shear is known to be beneficial for dynamo action, and shear can actually be the sole driver of dynamo action. This has been uh, shown with numerical simulations of a slightly different, a more simple setup where we have forced turbulence, non helically forced turbulence, and imposed shear. So, the really, uh, what we can call crucial experiment is that we only have rotation in our system, which would mean that we can only produce the large scale magnetic field by the alpha effect. And uh, at least when we started, we thought that, or there wasn't really too many such simulations available. And this was uh, basically in the astrophysical community, we didn't know about this, but uh, later we found out that in the geodynamo community, these were actually known for at least a decade now. And uh, still there was uh, a big debate because uh, these dynamos were not observed and then there were also contradicting uh, results for the alpha effect rotating convection. There were people who were saying that this is zero, and then there, there was us saying that it's uh, definitely not zero. And uh, it all boils down, down to the method by which you compute your turbulent transport coefficients, and how careful you are when you, you, you are using these methods. And uh, maybe now it would be good to uh, suggest that Axel or Karl Heinz or somebody could give some kind of an introduction to different methods of computing turbulent transport coefficients. We have that on Wednesday uh, next week. Uh, Matthias will give a thorough lecture on that. But that's okay. a bit late. And it's actually very thorough and it advanced. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. Okay, so what we were doing, we were using the test field method and then ramping up our rotation rates. And uh, this was just to, just to do a parameter study in the first place, just to see what happens when rotation increases. And uh, what really struck me in this figure is that when rotation is increased, then the alpha effect increases monotonically. And at the same time, the turbulent diffusion decreases monotonically. And then the obvious question is, well, what happens to the large-scale dynamo? Because essentially what determines whether you have a dynamo or not, a large-scale dynamo, is uh, the ratio of alpha and uh, eta. So we see alpha going up, eta going down, then we should see a large-scale dynamo in this same parameter range. And that's exactly what we see, actually, which is quite a, uh, an illuminating experience for me, at least. We see something which is, uh, well, that the theory predicts that you should see a large-scale dynamo. And then we do the direct simulation, and we do see a large-scale magnetic field developing. It's not as clear as in the case of shear because now actually the box is also bigger and now we have much more convection cells here. But when we look at the spectra, then we, this is the velocity spectra, so uh, this is where the kinetic energy, energy peaks, this is essentially the size of our convection bodies <coughs> here. And in the saturated state we always see that the magnetic field tends to peak at the largest possible scale. So, and uh, another thing here is that then when we increase the uh, box size, then we increase our uh, scale of separation, uh, which means that we have uh, more eddies in comparison to our system size, and uh, it's not so clear here, but it might be might be also beneficial for our large-scale dynamo. So there are no um, helicity fluxes and nothing right here. <coughs> yes, there are. We are using vertical field conditions, so we do have uh, we do allow many helicity flux to escape the system. Actually, in this case, we also did the case where we don't allow the <coughs> helicity flux. We still found a large data model. And actually I omitted one slide from our latest paper where we were doing a systematic study as a function of the Reynolds number. What happens if we allow or we don't allow any of the And uh, we don't see a qualitative difference in the excitation of the dynamo, but in the saturated state we see very big differences. So if we allow magnetic helicity flux to escape, then we see that the saturation level of the magnetic field is essentially constant with Reynolds number. But uh, if we don't allow magnetic helicity flux, then we see uh, an Rm to minus 1 behavior as a function of Reynolds number, magnetic Reynolds number. And uh, this we take as an <coughs> indication of the importance of magnetic helicity conservation. Okay, so, so we just sorry, uh, but we did just uh, rotation and convection. So the yeah, this field flux has not been calculated. In this. Yes, that's true. Hmm. So we don't actually know whether there is a flux, which is know that we can, by changing the boundary conditions, we can yes. allow or disallow it. Okay. So we don't actually know whether there is. A significant magnetic helicity flux. In no, it exists. Only thing I'm saying that we don't know the expression for such a thing. Right. Okay. So it's very nice to use these Cartesian models to study whether we have a dynamo and when we can have a dynamo. But there is a slight problem when compared to real stars, because real stars are not periodic boxes and all sorts of different phenomena can occur in spherical geometry. For example, we can, or we will have uh, the large scale shear uh, generated uh, self-consistently in spherical coordinates and not 
we don't have to compose it then by hand. And uh, but there are also problems with these full shell simulations. Here are a couple of examples. One example from Pranic Hall and uh, it's possible now to, with these models to reproduce the solar internal rotation profile, although not entirely self-consistently, self because here they have actually imposed a uh, tackle climb, and they also have to impose the temperature difference at the base of the convergence to get the rotation profile right. Uh, and another problem in these models is that while they do get a large-scale magnetic field, it's mostly confined in the overshoot layer below the convection zone, and it doesn't show any oscillations. And uh, furthermore, here's another example. This is a bit more rapidly rotating star. There you can actually see also in the convection zone large-scale magnetic fields. But it again seems that they are confined near the equator. We don't know how realistic this is in comparison to stars, so but, yes? Do you know if those codes include magnetic buoyancy or um, meridional velocity flows? I mean, those, uh, I mean, those are there when you have, I mean, they are solving the full MHD equations, so those effects are included. That magnetic buoyancy is normally never found to be important compared to the uh, downward pumping effect that you also see at the same time. So magnetic structures, if they are buoyant, they become weak because they expand. And then they become very subdominant compared to those structures that are actually transported downwards and get concentrated. But did you not be brought up by a marine velocity in your equator? They can, yeah, they, they can be, but it's uh, usually it's very difficult to, I mean, a lot of mean field modeling of the solar magnetic field is based on flux transport diagrams, which really rely on the meridional flow. But uh, such flow is uh, quite difficult actually to get from this sort of direct simulations. So in principle they can be there, but uh, it's not, it's not trivial to get them. So we don't actually know, also for the sun, we don't know what happens below something like 20 megameters. We don't know how the meridian of flow looks like. So, then if we look at the sun, where the sunspots occur, we see that they are also concentrated near the equator, plus minus uh, 40 degrees at most. So we could ask, do we actually really need a full sphere to model the essential ingredients of, for example, the solar dynamo? And uh, that's why we propose something like an intermediate approach that we don't, we go into spherical geometry, but we don't solve the full thing, but we just take some latitude and longitude range. So these are all wrong here. Uh, this figure is from the simulation where we have uh, 60 degrees from the equator and 120 degrees in longitude. And uh, otherwise this is very similar to the earlier model in Cartesian coordinates. So we use essentially the same boundary conditions for the magnetic field, the azimuthal direction is always periodic. Then we have uh, stress-free perfect conducting side boundaries here and also at the base. And then we have a vertical field or, or normal field condition at the top. <coughs> and uh, then we did a parameter study. This is, of course, very rudimentary compared to real solar, stellar environments. So here are three different simulations with no rotation, slow rotation, and then uh, quite rapid rotation. And uh, What's important here is uh, this third column here, where we see the rotation profile. When we have no rotation, we cannot expect to find different rotation either, which is good. And then with slow rotation, we have a 
slowly rotating the equation and rapidly rotating the poles, which is not going to be observed in the sun. And once we ramp up the rotation enough, we also find a rapidly rotating equator. But we see that the uh, features here are all aligned with the rotation vector, which is due to the Taylor problem balance that uh, is not realized in the sun. But uh, our simulation is not, uh, not yet uh, uh, quite there yet. We have to do some tricks like, like the other, other people in the field to get the rotation profile right, most likely. And uh, furthermore, what we see here, this is another kinetic helicity that can be in simple situations related to the alpha effect by this guy here, so we have a negative kinetic helicity in the northern hemisphere, so we should expect a positive alpha effect, and uh, <coughs> when we also have a positive radial differential rotation, we should expect the dynamo wave which propagates towards poles, and uh, this is what we see, if you look at the right figure here, so first we see blue patch at high latitudes, now it's replaced by a yellow one, and another blue one is here emerging near the equator. Here is the radial velocity near the surface of the star, and this is the toroidal magnetic field near the surface of the star. And uh, then we can look at the butterfly diagrams. So here we have radial uh, latitudinal and toroidal components of the field. Now I get to remember at which depth, probably close to the surface. Yes, close to the surface. And here we have the toroidal field at different depths. And uh, <coughs> what we see clearly here is that since one hemisphere seems to be stronger at all times and that at deeper layers we have the magnetic field that varies on a much longer time <coughs> than uh, the field near, near the surface and uh, <coughs> so, such hemispherical dynamos have been seen by for example Fritz Busse in rapidly rotating uh, full spheres actually and uh, we think that this is the same mechanism that uh, was working there. Yeah. Uh, what would happen if can, can the coupling between hemispheres uh, increase by increasing the diffusivity? So the things get together on the equator plane? That we haven't really checked systematically. So uh, that could be a possibility. We don't, simply we don't know yet. And uh, <clears throat> of course when we got this result we were really excited. This is something really amazing and new. But unfortunately Peter Gilman did it already in 1983. He had a very similar setup and he got very similar results. Here we just uh, see the azimuthally averaged azimuthal magnetic field. So you see these patches merging near the equator and then moving towards the pole. And uh, okay, that's all that you see basically in this animation. And that was all that I had. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Questions please. With the presence of shear, convection or turbulence, and the void will become anisotropic, right? Right. Does it play any role apart from just obvious fact that it will be an alpha tensor and an eta tensor? Uh, does it help the dynamic action? Is it, does it make any difference, no difference? You mean the anisotropy? An anisotropy, yes. For example, I remember. Uh, in different applications, uh, anisotropy since the alpha it was good to look at. 
that was getting there. That can, for example, uh, facilitate generation of, of non-asymmetric modes in a thin disk. Something like that. Are there any essential effects resulting from this? When you want to reproduce a dynamo using a dynamo model, you have done it first with an isotropic alpha effect. I thought this was subcritical. But if we uh -huh. took the full expression, uh -huh. but that involves not just the full yes. hyper tensor, but also the full eta tensor, uh -huh. then you do get and reproducing actually unmatched. Yes, yeah. that's right. So <coughs> what we see here is that we have actually four different curves here. One is the simulations, and then first of all we can we can take just an alpha shear dynamo where we have only the diagonal components of. <coughs> Alpha and dive into the And uh, we see that this is not, it's this dashed line here, it's not sufficient to explain our results, simulation results. So they do play a role. And uh, in this case, we need to have really the full expressions from our. The test. full tensor, right? The full tensor. Or, well, it's four components in this case, all the relevant components. So also the off-diagonal components of eta, because they can also try the dynamo. You have the shear current or the omega cross J dynamo. That also contributes. That's the right sign. Did they have the right sign? Uh, at some point, at some places, actually here you can see eta 2, 1. So it has to be negative here. Yes. So there are patches where it is negative. Yes. But the crucial uh, fact of shear, which at least Ethan Vishnia keeps pointing out, is the existence of a velocity flux, yes. which is absolutely dependent on the anisotropy induced by the shear. So, is there some measurement of such a thing in these models with shear? I mean, is there the Vishnia flux, flow flux? Oh, yeah, we haven't measured that. I mean, it may be that that is the thing which keeps the alpha alive, but I don't know, you know, it's, it's a... Yeah, but he, I mean, he has also dynamos, of course, but it's just uh, without shear. Yes. Then you have a different flux, of course. And then, of course, it's really not that. Uh, yes, then it's really not that. I'm just thinking of Anwar's thing about the rule of shear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, of course, one importance. Important part. Mm -hmm. yeah, we are just really in the process of learning how to measure the using fluxes in a good way, of course, which are normally gauge dependent, so we need to understand everything. We have a good track here. Yeah, any other question? Yes, please. Uh, using those simulations, can you spot any, you can spot the sources of toroidal and colloidal flux, of toroidal flux? Where the colloidal and toroidal field are produced, right? Well, uh, we can't really point at one one place and say that here. Yeah, I mean, in the bulk of the convection zone, top. Uh, well, okay, that's. Uh, uh, then you should look at where where our coefficients, what kind of profiles they have. So. Of course, uh, the alpha effect is uh, strongest in the convection zone that we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, in these models, the shear flow works everywhere. Also in the stable layer, where we don't have any convection. I was asking this because uh, I remember to see papers from Paul Sharbino and <coughs> That he uh, uses an alpha effect in the in the base of the shear. So due to uh, chemical currents, and I, I didn't quite understand that. And I wanted to see if, if those full uh, MHV uh, simulations could, could spot that, that alpha production on the base of the convection zone. I think you're talking about the Parker interface dynamo that he was modeling. Is that correct? Yes, I think so. Yeah. So the, should I say something about the Parker? So the Parker interface dynamo, I think, uh, was invented. So first of all, what it means is 
there is a separation in the layer where alpha works, namely alpha works in the convection zone, but <coughs> the shear works mostly below the convection zone. In addition, there was a, yes, and that's uh, the, the location where there's a small eta as well. And so therefore the shear operates and uh, has very strong effect in the overshot layer. Um, the reason why uh, one was placing alpha above the convection zone is because, or in the convection zone, whereas it, most of the toroidal field would be generated beneath, is because it was thought that uh, alpha quenching, in particular catastrophic alpha quenching, is really a local phenomenon. And so if uh, alpha, if the field is from beneath the convection zone, but there's no alpha, then you have nothing to quench. That's a naive idea. But that's not really correct, because the new understanding is that if you have quenching, what it really means is you are actually producing an alpha effect, but of the opposite sign, which could counteract an existing alpha effect. But if there is none, it would still produce an alpha effect with the opposite sign, in such a way that the total magneticity is attempted to be conserved. And so this idea that you, uh, that you think nothing can be quenched if there isn't anything to quench, that's not correct. And so that, uh, much of the foundation of, uh, of that is, I believe, no longer really founded. Uh, so that was the reason for such a setup. And I don't think, uh, I mean, you obviously don't have such a setup because no. he says he has shear uniformly through the entire domain by construction in the Cartesian simulations. You have, of course, the, the spherical simulations where shear is not imposed. Shear, shear comes yeah, the the shear result. arises uh, self-consistently, but there we haven't really uh, been able to do an al analysis of the turbulent transport coefficients yet. Because we don't have a test flow method in the spherical coordinates yet. But that's definitely something that we plan to do. I have another question. These coefficients when you determine, you probably can determine, you'll be determining it as a function of time, right? And yes. Are they the same when the field, <coughs> mean field was weak and when the mean field becomes stronger? These were, okay. Um, uh, at what time does this refer to when you're pro These are taken from a kinematic simulation, so we don't have a mean field in acting upon our velocity field. So these are purely kinematic coefficients. And that was, of course, in order to address the question whether you can explain the excitation of an alpha square dynamo at all, contrary to common belief at that time. Yeah, so we didn't try to do a mean field model of the nonlinear stage of the simulation. Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. But, um, so you are still solving the test field equations in the, in, at times when the field had not yet grown sufficiently. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, there, there is no field essentially in this simulation except for the test fields. And the velocity so field is not you are, affected. You are explaining using these coefficients what you see in the simulation, right? Yes, that's right. So we try to explain the part of the simulation where the field is weak okay. with these coefficients, which are determined for the kinematic state. And that's why you're plotting growth rates. Yes, that's right. Okay. And I still got confused. What are the different curves? Okay, you cut so off some pieces of the. Okay, so there's just uh, that we drop some components of alpha and eta in each of these. This one curve here is the simulations. Right. And then we have a curve where we have all the coefficients included in our mean field model. Then we have a model where we drop the off diagonal components of alpha and eta. And then further we have a model where we drop all the alpha coefficients and only use uh, the eta tensor. So the off diagonal components of eta do actually uh, are able to uh, try the dynamo here for this three points. Mm -hmm. Omega cross J, maybe. Yes, omega cross J and then also shear current, because this is for the case where we have shear and rotation. So we can't really distinguish between these two events. Mm -hmm. So 
So I believe the omega cross J effect, uh, I mean, that carries the name Redler effect that was coined by Paul Roberts back in the 70s. So this effect goes back to an re early result of Karl Heinz's of the year 69. Right. We'll hopefully hear more about that. But it's not normally believed to be critical for the sun. So it's just something to know about and to understand. OK. Any other questions? Ah, please. Uh, this model is a non compressible model of the dynamo process. Your code is a compressible model. Yes. So, what are the uh, effects of the compressible flow on the dynamo process? Well, uh, in our case, we expect uh, compressibility to play a minor role because the Mach number is still fairly small, of the order of 0.1 at most. I can say one thing, uh, but the so-called small-scale dynamo, we do know, has uh, feels an adverse effect from large Mach numbers. So if you make the Mach number bigger than one, the uh, threshold for dynamo action becomes higher by a factor of about two. And then, about, uh, then it stays about constant again. Then it doesn't matter whether you have a Mach number one or five or bigger than that, perhaps. That's what we know for the small-scale dynamo. For the large-scale dynamo, we expect essentially no dependence. But that has never been looked at carefully. Any other questions? If that's not the case, then let's thank Petri again. <laughs> so this has been a long day, of course, for all of you. Uh, I remind you, you have enough space uh, to work and to sit in the two buildings, or including the upper floor of the house 13. You can also get the food from the, uh, from the uh, pizza place down there, for example, which some of you can show you where it is. And you can come back up again. There's also an Ica shop in a supermarket uh, that's opposite to that place. So it's just down when you go to, down to Bilga Yards Garden. Okay, otherwise we see you again at 9 o'clock in the morning. Start with you again. Start with you again. Oh, 9 o'clock. Was there a question?